morning. Thank you for joining us. We're out in the garden today and we're going to do a flow frame inspection. We harvested oh, on, this frame here on. right on the edge of the hive and that was a week ago. So it'd be interesting to, to get in there and have a look, not because we need to, but because we want to show you how to pull your frames out should you need to. Uh, perhaps you're just curious and you want to learn more about it or perhaps there's a uh, issue you want to solve. So uh, I'm going to go through some tips and tricks on how to actually pull those frames out and inspect them. And if you've got questions, put them in the comments and we'll get to answering those as we go. So the first thing to do is get yourself protected, of course. If you're new to beekeeping, don't try and be a hero. Wear a good bee suit, wear your gloves, put your veil on, and make sure you're looking after yourself and others around you. So I've got the smoker here and I'm um, adding some smoke to the entrance of the hive. And that's the first thing you do. I just did that a minute ago. I'll do it again just to show you. You get your smoker blowing nice, cool smoke. If it's been sitting around for a while, it actually runs out of steam. So you want to get it going again, repack it with some more fuel if necessary. And when it's blowing nice, cool smoke, if you're going gloveless, you can smoke your hands to limit the smell, that mammal smell, which triggers bees. And you're just putting it right in the entrance, a few puffs like that. And then leave the smoker by the entrance so the bees get a bit of a whiff of it as they come home. So first of all, taking the roof off. Then next will be the inner cover. So. You can see through the side windows here, this is the frame we harvested, say, a week ago. And it looks like they're already putting nectar in it. We'll get a better view of it when we pull it right out. And in the back of the hive here, you've got uh, quite a lot of honey showing there's a good honey flow. They're filling things up again, which is great. Any questions, put them in the comments today if you're just tuning in. We're showing you how to actually pull the flow frames out of the hive should you need to. It's a bit different to normal beekeeping frames, so I'll run through some tips and tricks with that. We'll take the inner cover out and uh, just pop the inner cover off the hive, sorry. Now sometimes they would have put a bit of wax up there if they're a strong colony. There we go. So they were looking for more places to store honey recently. They've actually put some comb between the inner cover and the lid. Often they don't, but sometimes they do. Look at that. It's, it's a um, beautiful thing to see that fresh new honey coming in like that. Excellent. So we've got an excluder on this hive, so we don't need to worry about uh, looking for the queen on the inner cover. We can just put this aside. And I'll just put it somewhere where remaining bees can just crawl into the hive, like that. Okay, next we'll uh, pick a frame to pull out. Now we might just go for that one right that we harvested last week. Now, there's a lot of bees in this hive, so what we've got to be careful of is rolling bees as we pull the frame out. And to limit that, what I'm going to do is add some smoke down between the frames just to uh, uh, get some of the bees moving out of the way. So I'm putting it right down the edges here. So after you've got the first frame out, this is the same goes for brood frames, then it gets a lot easier. So notice how the bees are kind of clearing away from the smoke and I'm just, I'm not, I'm just gently puffing like that. And um, that means there'll be less bees between those two frames as we pull it out. Now let's just go over the lifting points. There's one at the back here that we use this J tool for. There's one under the frame here. And there's one at the bottom here. So it can be good to loosen that up. If you get the hive tool under here, and just give it a little lift like that. And if you need to, you can come down here as well. And the J hook here goes under the end bar like that. And so matter of just rotating it, it lifts it up. And you can use the other end, is easy to hang on to. 
So we're just gently, gently coming up. And now we have a frame that has been freshly harvested a week ago. And you can see the way the bees have ripped off all the capping and they're filling these cells with nectar you can see in here. If you've got questions, put them in the comments. So there you go, they've done their repair work, they've ripped off all the capping, they've recycled it, they've recreated the cells, they're storing nectar, and they're starting to reduce that water content. Super clever bees. Beautiful. So sometimes, depending on how busy the colony is and whether they've got a nectar flow, they might leave some of the capping on for a while. If we have a look at the other side, you can see that they're almost ready to put capping on here. They're really, in, in a week, they've brought in enough nectar to, to create quite a lot of honey already in this frame. It's good to see. Let's have a look at the next frame. And I'm just gonna lean that one up against the hive here like that and see what it looks like. So I'm going to go crossways now, which is a good thing to do no matter what type of beekeeping you do. Uh, is a lever a crossways first, if you can, if it's not the first frame. There's a few bees in the, way, so in the way, so again, I can just add a little bit of smoke and those bees will clear out of that spot where I'm trying to work. Now I'll go sideways first. You can get right between the frame like that, between the end bars, same on the other side. And then when you pull it up, you won't be rolling bees between the frames. And it'll come up easier. So there we go, this one feels heavy. It's got lots of honey in it. Look at that. Beautiful frame here, all capped all the way. A really good one to harvest. And you can see by looking at the end window, that, that is reflected there as well. So sometimes they can get hungry and start eating sections of the comb away, but generally the end view and the side views give you a good idea of what's going on in the hive. So you can harvest these frames without having to pull the hive apart. However, if you're curious, you wanna learn more, or you've got a problem, this is how you pull the flow frames out of your flow super. Beautiful, there's some pollen on the legs of this one here. Very nice. Any questions? Yeah, I've seen lots of people uh, tuning in this morning, but Bradley's just wondering, are we exper experiencing a nectar flow at the moment? We are experiencing nectar flow. You can see by the way, when we harvested last week, it filled up quite quickly. It's not as strong as it was earlier on in spring, but it's there nonetheless, and they are, they are filling up. So in that early springtime, you can get into the situation where you'll harvest it and they'll fill it up uh, within a week, straight away again, even all of your frames. So that's when there's a really strong nectar flow. There's just a mild nectar flow going on now, but a nectar flow nonetheless. So it's a good time to keep storing a bit of honey while the nectar flows on by tapping it off, putting it into jars and keeping it on your shelf. It's a bit different to conventional beekeeping where you're often adding boxes as the nectar flow goes on, adding more boxes, adding more boxes and storing the, uh, and, and harvesting all at once a whole lot of boxes from a whole lot of hives. Instead we can just keep tapping off honey into jars and keeping them on our shelf. So we're storing honey in jars instead of in so many boxes. Having said that, you can add more boxes if you want to. Right, so to just on, when you took off that inner cover, is there, are they both the same dimensions on the inner cover? One of, one of our customers, sorry, one of um, the Facebook Live people are asking, is there two different sides to that inner cover? The inner cover is the same on both sides. However, between our models, there is some discrepancies. Unfortunately, we've, we've um, got the way we started. We started in multiple countries at once, uh, manufacturing USA and Australia, and the sizes were a little bit different. And um, we've still got sizing um, discrepancies between the Classic and the Flow Hive 2. But as far as which way up you put the inner cover, it doesn't matter. Right. Cedar, this is a good one. You're going to love this. Um, I'm not sure where um, this person's tuned in from, but one of the, the beehives was destroyed by a bear. 
and then their second beehive was destroyed by wild mouses. <laughs> yeah, wild. What should I do to protect? Wild bears and wild mouses. <laughs> mouses. Far out. I'm glad we don't have the uh, the bears here. Um, you know, I mean, these bees haven't seen bears in a long time. Um, but what <laughs> what do you do about it? Uh, um, s somebody who's got some experience with bears and bees, please chime in on the thread. It's great if we can help each other answer questions uh, in the thread. Um, but I guess. Um, You've got to protect your hive from bears with some kind of fence. I have heard of people keeping bees who live in an area where bears often attack hives, them actually keeping it in an old abandoned vehicle so the bear can't get to the hive. <laughs> but that seems pretty extreme. Um, we've got cane toads that eat bees here. They tap on the hive at night and uh, they, the bees come out to see what's going on. They eat them. That's why we lift them up off the ground a bit but we don't have any animals that are going to rip the hive apart, which is lucky for us here. And mice, um, might be a good idea to reduce the entrance size for mice. Um, there's a few ways you can do that. We've now got an entrance reducer, or you can uh, reduce it with anything like um, a, a metal mesh is often used if you're having mice problems getting into your hive in the winter time. Our bees work all year round so the mice don't get in, but it's more of a problem for people who have a long, cold, snowy winter. The bees are moving up through the hive and the mice can take advantage of making a nest down in the bottom of the hive, Make, making a mess of all the brood frames. Um, yeah, that's a rough way to start your beekeeping. I hope you have better luck next time. <laughs> Um, so the Tiz is asking, who tunes in every week, just wondering, just needs, wants to re-oil um, her hive, when's the best time of day to do that? So if you, it, you can, I often do oil hives with the bees in them. Now, of course, protect yourself from stings. And if you are going to be doing the entrance side, the best time I've found is really early in the morning when there's less bees on the entrance side. My sister's just uh, joined in. She does all of our amazing macro photography and slow-mo photography. And it's, uh, it's great to, to see. I'm not sure if you can see that. Maybe if I put a little shadow across it, that'll help you see the um, bees. No, it's good with that. OK, great. Maybe you, just can't see. you can see the wax capping as well. You can see the wax capping there. You, there was uh, oh, here's a little feeding circle happening. A feeding circle. There's four. So there's bees passing. Oh, five. Bees passing nectar from mouth to mouth. The forage bees come back full of nectar from flowers and then they pass it to a receiver bee in the hive and multiple receiver bees in this case. And then that gets passed from bee to bee a few times and then it gets deposited in the cell where it gets further dehydrated into honey. <laughs> Very cool, isn't it? And all the while they're reducing <laughs> the water seen content. I've never like that before. So, so, so I imagine that uh, passing from bee to bee helps strip the water content out as well as they take some of the water out with their bodies. And, and so there's some of the dehydration. And then also they're using bee air conditioning to evaporate the water from the nectar and produce honey, all the while adding some of their special sauce with their enzymes and you end up with this beautiful product we call honey full of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and enzymes and medicinal properties. It's just um, an amazing thing and somehow the honey from your local area always tastes better. It's um, just a joy to have the flavours from around you. And a hive like this will be foraging on up to a 10 kilometre radius and bringing all of that nectar back into your hive and doing their amazing work creating the honey. Here's some nice pollen bags. If you can get right on top of this frame here, you might have to jump up a level. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Almost fell off. So there we go. Oh yeah. Look at that. Beautiful um, orange pollen they're bringing in there. Oops, you'll see pollen that's orange. You'll see that. There we go. You see pollen that's white. 
you see it purple, mauve. Almost black, like a really dark brown I've seen, and white. And it's important for bees to get a variety because pollen is their protein. And like us, if we ate one protein source and that's all we ate, we would get sick. And that's why beekeepers will move their hives if they're on a monofloral source, let's say they're only on, on canola, rapeseed, then they'll get sick eventually. So they have to move them away to get a variety of protein. So it's good if, if in your area you've got a variety, often you do, of flowering species around and that will keep the bees healthy. Any questions? Yes, yeah, Cedar, so I'm just wondering, can you use a propolis tray in the flow hive? So the way people collect propolis is with a mesh and you put a mesh in the hive and the bees go, oh, that's a bit annoying and they block it all up with their propolis. Then you take that, that mesh out and you scrape or remove the propolis from that mesh. So you can do that in any beehive. Um, I'm not sure there might be ones that are specific for, for different hives, but I imagine you can just put that into, into um, any hive you like. Um, and you might want to add another box to do that with, so you're just on top of some conventional frames. But have a go, see how it works. Cedar, a couple of people have actually mentioned this today, saying that the, the end view of the frame doesn't look like it's full of honey, but they pull out their flow frames and it all looks completely capped. Um, just wondering what's happening on inspections, or do some bees just maybe don't like filling the end? You can get that actually. I've certainly seen genetics that are reticent to fill the end of the frame, which is quite annoying when you're waiting for that look to see if they're ready. So if you suspect that's happening, you might want to pull some frames out and just get a good idea of what the end frame view is compared to what's actually happening in the hive. Mostly they will fill up that end frame view last, so you might just need to wait for a nectar flow to, uh, for them to get out and finish that last cell. But as said, you can get some bees who just don't like to fill the last cell. Um, if that's happening in your hive, have a look inside as it sounds like you've done and um, you might have to use the side windows to, to gauge when your hive's filling up nicely. And see, so is that the same? Um, Emma's also asking on that sort of same question. If one side of the frame's capped but the other isn't, can you harvest it? Uh, it's best to wait till you've got mostly capped. Conventionally, beekeepers will wait for about 70% capped just to make sure that moisture content's low. Ideally as much capping as you can get on your frames and that way your honey will keep on the shelf. No big deal if you mess it up and you harvest a bit early. Uh, it just means you'll need to consume that honey before it ferments. Keeping... I'm sure your family and friends will help. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you keep it in the, um, in the fridge that can make it last longer as well. But most of the time you get it right and you end up with honey. It'll come out a bit warmer so it'll come out more liquid as you're harvesting from the hive. But as it cools down, you put it on the shelf, it should stiffen up and look like honey. Now you can get a refractometer to test that, but generally if it's nice and thick and behaves like honey, then it's going to last on the shelf. No. And Cedar, is there any difference between on those capping and the photos you've just been showing? Some look raised and some look flat. What's the difference? So generally it's the nectar flow will affect bees cap it sort of really flush or sometimes even indented or out further and sometimes they'll draw it well beyond the flow frame. So that's just really the difference. It doesn't matter either, either way but uh, it's nice to see when it's really nice and proud and the bees are on a good nectar flow then you, it means you're getting some good honey coming in. Oh, here's, a, here's another. We're getting some good questions in here this morning all about animals and wildlife. This one is Jacob saying there was like a boo, bird poo kind of looking thing on the landing boards and he flicked it off and cleared it all off and then the bees came out. Any ideas on that one? Uh -huh. <laughs> so bees will protect their entrance. So that's the place that you need to be most careful. Some hives are gentle and you can mess around the, at the entrance and they're not worried but others will get really defensive if you put your hand near the entrance of their hive. There's guard bees that sit there and their job is to stop predators, mammals and things 
actually getting into your hive, wrecking your hive, stealing the honey and so on. So that's where, that's what you've come into to contact with is the bees at the entrance, the guard bees, getting a bit protective. And sometimes it doesn't necessarily mean you've got a really aggressive hive. Um, sometimes you'll get a colony that's actually quite nice to work with and doesn't tend to bother humans around it too much. But getting aggressive. If you find your hive is generally aggressive and becoming a nuisance, then it might be time to get a new queen and change the genetics. And a month later, you'll have a different temperament in your hive. Great questions. Yeah, some really good, and, and of course, the, everyone's spying and they're noticing some things happening in the background of you, Cedar, and someone said, is that all wood chips from the beehives? <laughs> <laughs> it's not from the beehives. We're just planting and we're removing some weed species, um, <laughs> the camphor laurel here in Australia and we're going to be planting beautiful pollinator species there. So we look forward to showing that off when, when those medicinal plants start blooming. Yeah, fantastic. And Fred Dunn was just asking that very question, if that was what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Creating um, a bee paradise. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> um, and Chuck Rouse joined us this morning as well, saying hi to everyone and to the Bee Spy Mirror, who's hi. one of our ambassadors. Um, <laughs> Kuji's asking at Kuwaramup, I'm not sure where that is, just wondering when the bees start moving into the flow hive section, how often should you inspect the brood box? Okay, inspecting the brood box it varies widely depending on your location. So the best uh, answers are going to come from your local beekeepers depending on what's going on in the environment. For instance, if you've got a long, cold, snowy winter and you've got mites in your country, the varroa mites, then it's going to be completely different to here. Here we've got a pretty much all-round beekeeping season and you're, you're either inspecting because you're curious to see where they're up to and you're taking splits and, uh, and that sort of thing, or you're doing your routine inspections for pests and diseases. Or, as, as need basis, you notice the numbers are dropping in a hive and you just want to get in there and check that there's still a laying queen and that the hive's happy and healthy. Perhaps they've been on a bit of a changeover and they've changed their queen and, and they're getting back on their feet. Or perhaps there's an issue you need to solve. There could be uh, uh, an issue where there's chalk brood or, or, uh, or AFB or EFB in your hive and that's why it's a requirement of beekeeping to inspect a couple of times a year, going through each brood frame, making sure that the AFB or EFB aren't present. Uh, but yeah, as said, uh, beyond that, in this location, it's more as an as-need basis and in the springtime doing your spring management mainly to limit swarming behavior so that you don't uh, get half your bees flying off over the neighbor's fence. Cedar Cormac's asking what sort of nectar flow are we having here like what do we get in this area? So in this area we've just had one called the wild quince which is um, a species which has an amazing floral punch to it when you eat that, it almost blows the taste buds right out of, it, out of your mouth. It's this super light, super floral flavour, and if you get a lot of it in your frame, you really know about it. Now, that's completely different to the winter flowers that, that the bees are on here. They get on the uh, paper barks and things down in the wet areas down in the valley and also the heathland, and you get these dark brown tones, and you get even all the way to black where you cannot see through the jar of honey. So there's a massive range of flavours and colours and it's incredible to watch that and to be able to isolate those flavours frame by frame in the hive. Okay, bro. Thank okay. you. <laughs> nice. Top up the smoker. Top up the smoker. If you've been standing around chin wagging for a while, you need to <laughs> make sure you, you fill up your um, smoker again and, and get it and going you. again with a few puffs. Especially when you've got a sister next to you to help you <laughs> reload. Cedar, if you harvested um, this hive, do you leave some of the frames full for the bees? That all depends. So if, you, if you're seeing a nectar flow and you've got a, a, a reason to believe there's more flowers coming, 
then you can go ahead and harvest it or make some space for the bees to store more honey and that way you'll be able to store more honey on the shelf as well. If you suspect that there's a dearth coming, which is when there's no nectar, no flowers available for the bees, then leave some for them. And how much you leave will depend on a bit of local knowledge. If you've got a long, cold, snowy winter ahead, then you typically want to leave a, a, a lot of honey, a full box of honey on your hive. Here we don't have that, so we can just go ahead and harvest this frames of full pretty much all year round. Cedar, is it possible to attract bees to the flow hive when you live in an urban city? When you live in an urban city, you'll, you'll get a lot of uh, great flavours, a lot of people plant a lot of flowers and so on, and that's, uh, that's a great thing. Now in terms of attracting them to the hive, generally you put bees in there, and, and that's, a, um, that's the way you get started, either by starting with a, a nuke or starting with a package. It's all good. Um, <laughs> that, my, my brother's moving some machinery around, uh, but it'll stop in a minute. Okay. Oh, great. Sorry, Family Sarah. affair here today. We've got, we've got, got Jai in the background, my nephew, we've got my, my sister here doing some filming, we've got my brother doing some gardening uh, with some uh, machinery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, what's the um, longevity of the Flow Hive? And I guess the company itself has been going for six years. What, what do you expect the Flow Frames to last for? So, we've designed it to last as long as possible, right? And we hope that it lasts for many, many years. But as I said, we've been around six years. We've still got frames in our hives that are, that are six years old now, which is wonderful. And, and thank you so much to all of you that have helped start our company and get it off the ground to share our invention with the world. And do let us know if you have any problems, we will look after you. So as far as the wood is concerned, then Wood outdoors will always be fighting nature a little bit. Nature wants to turn it back into earth again. Having it off the ground helps, and the Western Red Cedar Wood is one of the longer lasting woods. The, the hoop pine that we also use, also called Aracaria, it's, it's uh, also a long lasting in terms of, it will last way longer than your standard pine species out there. So I've tried to choose things that will last a long time. And however, you know, five, six years in, you're going to, depending on what wood choice you had, you're going to have, and also depending on, on what's going on in your environment, whether it's really wet and so on, you might find that you need to replace some parts of your hive also. Right. See, Lorraine is asking that um, their bees are starting to bed and they think that where the hive is, it might be too hot. What's the, so they want to move the hive, what's the best way to do that? Okay, so generally Australian summer hives can be out in the full sun and it's no problem. Bees bearding is okay. Now if you're in a, a, a swarmy time of year, then you've just got to manage, if, if they're really building up, if you look in the side window, there's so many bees in there, they're also bearding then they might be gearing up to swarm. Sometimes you can get a late swarm, but usually that's more in the early springtime. Now, so bearding isn't necessarily a problem, but um, if you find that your hive is really packed full, you've got the beard out the front and there's bees packed so you can't see the frames in the side windows, then you can either take a split from that hive or add a, another box to give them some more room. If you want to move them to a shadier location, then go for afternoon shade. It's good to have some sun on the hive. It helps with things like chalk brood to have a more sunny, uh, ventilated place. Right. These little bees um, chewing back the propolis that they've used. So you maybe want to talk about what the propolis is. Okay, so propolis, Unlike wax, which is secreted from their wax glands, propolis is actually collected from the sap of trees. Now, they use that to stick together all of the areas of the hive where they 
want to limit uh, ventilation. So if there's a crack, they'll fill it up with propolis. And you can see it here, if I scrape this tool along, you see quite a lot of propolis uh, coming off there. Now, sometimes you can get a big lot of that, it's good to chew on, it helps with colds and so on. Uh, and it, it turns into kind of a chewing gum thing. But you can see a bunch of bees here going, hmm, I might just, while this propolis is sitting here idle doing nothing, I might just start relocating some of that. So that's what these bees are doing. It's, um, it's neat. They sort of mix a little bit of a mixture of propolis and beeswax together. Right. Cedar uh, Mario is asking in Brisbane, the queen, uh, the queen's coming on to its third year. Just wondering when's an ideal time of the year to replace her? So commercial beekeepers will replace every couple of years and in some cases every year just to keep the bees really pumping with a lot of egg laying. What I tend to do is if, if I'm happy with what the colony's doing and I don't need that extra bit of production, I'll just leave her. If she's a nice queen, the colony's good, the numbers are great, I'll just leave her in the hive till um, she is actually uh, superseded or the numbers drop or the, perhaps the hive gets aggressive or something like that, then you, I would consider replacing. Otherwise, just leave her be. Just leave her be. <laughs> <laughs> Cedar Richards in Texas, um, just commenting, you said that a lot of people seem to over, over, overly inspect their hives and then you've just mentioned inspecting it several times a year. Is there a consensus, consensus or does it vary on different where you are? Or? Ask two beekeepers, you'll get three different answers <laughs> and that's pretty much everything in beekeeping. So it's, if, you, if you're really uh, getting into inspecting your hive, then that's fantastic because there's a lot of learning that goes on every time you open up a hive. Mira's just spotted a few different things in here uh, and uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to really notice and question and research and find out what's going on. Uh, it's a beautiful thing to be able to get in there and do that learning. So don't be afraid to inspect it often. However, you should at least inspect your brood frames in Australia a couple of times a year for pests and disease issues. Right. Cedar, Debbie's asking, if you have burr comb on the flow frame, should you still use your hive tool to scrape it off or is that a bit risky? You can use your flow frame, you, you won't damage it, so just go for it. So if, if you've got burr comb up here, now when we opened this hive there was uh, some comb and some honey that was built between the flow frames and the inner cover. Now the bees have mopped up all that honey super quickly. Have a look, it's all gone already. At the start we showed you that beautiful honey glistening when we opened. So to, to clean it off, add a little bit of smoke just to get the bees away and seize a moment where the bees aren't in the path and just scrape it like this. And you can scrape some of that wax off. You don't have to, you can leave it there. The bees will use it from time to time, recycling. But you can clean them up if you want and it'll just make it a bit easier to get the lid off next time. Here you can see some with honey, right? There's, there's still a few cells with honey in under here, I think. If I scrape this, I should see honey. They've cleaned up the stuff on top already. And here we go, yep. So there's some swirls you can chew on after you take your bee veil off. Uh, there we go, sis. <laughs> Thanks. This is uh, we need to be well. Pooh Bear number two. <laughs> 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 and um, that way you can clean them up and, and keep them clean. As I said, you don't have to, you can just leave that there for the bees. Yum. <laughs> and then we can get very cute little bees. Slurping. Slurping up the spoils on top of the frame. Look at that. Beautiful, isn't it? Amazing. Many of you would have seen my sister Mira's amazing photography. and slow-mo, everything bees. Mira does almost all of that uh, photography. She's totally mad about bees and it's wonderful to be able to learn from the amazing imagery she gets. That looks amazing, Mira. I so, wish I had a photo of the three of you up there. <laughs> <laughs> it, looks so good. it looks like you're doing an operation or something. Yeah. <laughs> Cedar, Selena's asking, um, wants to cycle an old brood, brood frame into a super, but just wondering what the bees would do with the pollen and the bee bread that is present. Cycle a... Brood frame into the super. Yep. Yeah. 
pollen and a bee. Pollen and bee bread. Yeah, so that's no problem. You can cycle bees into a super, brood um, frames into a super. However, they, they won't fit in your flow super very well. So if you've got a standard super above that, then you can cycle upwards. Otherwise, what you can do is, if you've, if you've only got pollen in there, and uh, then you could just cut that out. You might enjoy chewing on it. It's pretty wild gear. Good thing to uh, surprise your friends with, say chew on that. <laughs> <laughs> the bee bread's pretty wild in flavor. It is. Um, and you can just chop that right out. And if you're doing naturally drawn comb, you can put the frame straight back in and away they go again. So that's one way to cycle out. Another way is if you did have any brood in that frame, then you obviously don't want to take that uh, frame away with brood on it. So you might even decide to put the frame on its side under the roof. Wait um, a week or two for those bees to emerge from their, their cells and then you can cycle that frame away because there's no more brood on it anymore. If you do that, putting a frame sideways under the roof, then you'll need to prop it up just a little bit flat on the inner cover. But that's one trick you can do. Interestingly enough, bees will actually start storing honey in a vertical fashion, uh, which is amazing. Bees are so clever, they can even store honey upwards into cells. <laughs> so clever. Cedar Simon's asking, this is a good one, from Adelaide in South Australia. So he's got a hive, he's got two brood boxes and one super. He wants to take off one brood box and then add a super, realising that he'd need to make sure obviously both brood boxes had queens. Would there be any other issues or problems that you could see that would in doing that? Ah, so it sounds like you're taking a split if you're, if you're taking a brood box off and hoping it and needing another queen. Yep. So splitting a big hive into two is a great thing to do. And what you can do is shuffle it a bit. So you've got basically uh, start another hive, well, move the hive with the queen over a bit because it's, it's the one that will get most of the returning foragers. And the other one without the queen, assuming you can identify it, um, make sure that it's getting lots of returning foragers because the bee numbers are going to drop for a while. But you could put half of the brood in one hive and half in the other if you just wanted to make an even split. If you're going to do that and there's going to be the bee numbers dropping and you're in an area with the small hive beetle, just make sure you're really keeping an eye on that and trapping that and make sure none of the comb is touching each other uh, where the bees can't service it because the hive beetles can and will take over if they can. Um, so there's, there's a few ways to do a split. Normally I leave one strong colony and start a weaker one beside it, but you can do an even split like, like that by taking your, your two brood boxes, putting them beside each other. Obviously you need another baseboard and, and, and uh, inner cover and roof. And just make sure that if you can't find the queen, that both colonies have the ability to raise a queen. So that means little eggs like grains of rice down the cells. Get right in there and have a look. And they, the one that doesn't have a queen could raise a queen from that uh, by, it's an amazing thing, but they basically will um, continue to feed royal jelly to one of those, those worker bees and it'll turn into a queen. You can also add a new queen, and that can be a great thing to do if you want some known genetics, you really want a nice gentle hive, then buy in a queen from a queen breeder and add that to the hive without. Of course, if you're doing that, you'll need to know which hive the queen is in. Fantastic. Always so, long answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now here's, this is a short one, this is three words, Cedar. Farms wants to know, um, they're in Milwaukee in Wisconsin, can you give me three words that describe your amazing product? Only three. Three words. <laughs> well, perhaps if people on a thread could give us three words to describe our product, that would be less naff, maybe. <laughs> um, that would be good if anyone can chime in on the thread. Yeah, that, that, that's not enough words for you, see, it's only three. <laughs> also, he's wondering, um, they get winters below zero Fahrenheit. Could, could, is it all right to have a, beehive, a flow hive there? 
Yes, it is. It is. We've got people keeping flow hives as far as Norway and also up in Canada and also in, in Europe where there's also very cold winters. What have we got here? What's the she's bee spy scene? Stingy. She's fanning her Nazanoff gland and she had her stinger out. Oh, interesting. Look, it's from that girl. She stopped. So the Nazanoff gland is a gland they use to release the pheromones and often to say, hey, hey, our hive is here. So if anyone's getting confused, uh, follow the scent and this is our hive. So they're fanning their Nazanoff gland yeah, to do that. And you see that with their tails in the air and almost a, a little kink in the, in the tail, just exposing that gland and then they'll be clinging as they fan. Yeah, this girl, she's got a stinger out, look. Okay, darling, right in. Fanning with a stinger out, that might be just something that's cool. Um, perhaps that is getting a bit trendy or something. It's unusual. <laughs> Fred Dunn's three words, Cedar, honey on tap. Oh, nice. Hot, that's a good hot. one, Fred. Hot. Hot. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. Cedar, any tips or tricks on cleaning out chalk brood that's happened um, in one of the flows of uh, flow frames? Yes. Um, you shouldn't get chalk brood in flow frames because the bees should be uh, building their brood in, in, down here. Now, chalk brood often can be solved by just moving your hive into a nice sunny location, but if that fails, there's a couple of things to do. And one is you can introduce a new queen, so new genetics can help just clean out all of that chalk brood. Well, the other thing that some beekeepers do, and let me know if it's worked for you, it's, a, it's one of those controversial beekeeper things, but some beekeepers swear that if you put banana skins or even slice bananas in half and chuck them on top of your brood, it's like a big stink bomb for the, for the hive. It's a bit like, a dog coming in and doing a do on your carpet. You're gonna clean, not only the dog, but you're probably gonna do like a whole spring clean of the house. And that's kind of what is said to happen when you throw bananas in a hive because it contains a smell that's very similar to one of their pheromones. And they'll get in there and clean shop and kick out that chalk brood. But other beekeepers say no, that would have cleaned out anyway and doesn't actually work. So let me know if it works for you. Great. Cedar Kathleen, innovative, efficient and awesome. And Janet, very brilliant concept. Oh, very nice. <laughs> Getting some good ones. James Thank you for is, all your kind words. Exactly. James has tuned in from Kempsey. Just wondering, the flow, flow frames seem to be full of honey, but the bees aren't capping them. Any tips or tricks on that one? Full of honey, but bees aren't, aren't capping. capping them. So they'll just take a little longer. They need a bit more nectar or perhaps they're, they're still dewatering it. If they're, if they're full of honey but not capped, it shouldn't be long now. They should get in there and cap it, unless the nectar's run out, in which case they might just be starting to consume that because they do need that source of, of honey to raise their brood and keep themselves alive. Okay. Um, Doug's, it's winter in Colorado where Doug is and harvested it's all completed and got lots of honey. Just wondering is it better to feed the bees back with sugar or with po uh, or pollen? Okay. Honey back or sugar and pollen, sorry. Okay, that's, that's another one. Ask three beekeepers, you get different answers. Some people like to actually take some frames away and keep them in the freezer and feed that back to that hive. Now, if um, if you are going to feed a hive honey, then it must be from that hive. You don't want to be sharing pathogens from one hive to the other. And it also must be inside the hive. You do not leave honey exposed outside or you create a crazy robbing frenzy that can decimate your whole apiary and spread pathogens from hive to hive. So um, the, you can, um, most beekeepers will feed sugar and some beekeepers will feed sugar and pollen cakes or patties that are made by a, a, um, a beekeeping supply place. I don't have much experience in feeding pollen because we don't need to do it in this location. We've always got some things flowering. 
However, occasionally you'll find people feeding sugar. Perhaps you've got a really weak colony that hasn't got it together to find flowers further afield. There's a bit of a dearth. My sister Mira was feeding some recently because she's a complete bee nut and she's continuing to, to um, raise nukes and raise nukes. And if they're not getting enough nectar, she'll feed them to do that. So uh, that's a sugar water solution. And if you, if you have a look around, there's thick syrup and there's thin syrup. Basically, if you have lots and lots of sugar dissolved in the water and it's thicker, that's usually used for storing honey. You'll, that, people will do that prior to winter to store some, if there's not enough stores in the hive, it's better to have sugar stores than no stores, right? So they'll do that. Um, and in springtime, some beekeepers like to get a jump on the season by feeding a, a thin uh, syrup which is similar to nectar and then it stimulates the queen to start laying early when the flowers finally come out the numbers are already up and they're ready to roll so there's a few reasons there for feeding in this area we don't really need to do any feeding at all usually Right, Cedar, Peter's asking, can, um, can they, you seal your new hive with decking oil? You can. That's a, a popular thing to do. If you're going to go with a product for your hive, I would recommend the decking products because they're made for keeping wood looking like wood outdoors. They're the most hard wearing and that, that's the, the best thing to do if you want to keep your hive looking nice and wooden for longer. Great. Nature's helping hand. There's another three words for you. Um, <laughs> Kathleen's also saying that they fed their bees chamomile bee tea. Wow. Yeah. That's a new one. That, that's a bit nifty, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, might put them to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> nice calm bees. That would be uh, good for a grumpy hive. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, everyone always mirror is noticing your fantastic photography and then everyone always wants to know what you're using your lenses your everything uh, I've got a combination going on today because I'm just gotten the new iPhone 13 Pro Max which has a macro lens uh, setting and I'm just learning how to use it so you can go to the wide angle onto the 0.5 lens and then you can actually get very close I guess one thing that I don't have is the manual focus control which I'd like so I haven't used that as much yet. And then what I have on my old camera phone is a moment macro lens, which is attached to the case. Um, that's what I've shot everything that you would have watched with the moment lens. Um, I'm waiting for the adapter so it fits the new phone. And so I'm just kind of doing a bit of... <laughs> <laughs> this one, that one. This one, that one, this one, that one. Because I can get a bit closer with this than I can with the with the new one but it will be really exciting to see this with the adapter with the macro lens but yeah the moment moment do a great little macro macro lens and all the new phone seems to do a pretty good job actually it's amazing isn't it so 90 something percent of our content uh, <laughs> when it comes to macro bees and slow-mo is done on phones and the original video the original time lapse that we kicked off in 2015 was an iPhone 4. Yeah, so it's <laughs> iPhone 4. Yeah, so, so you just use what you've got and uh, it's more about getting in there and really tuning in with what's going on than which device you have. Yeah, indeed, you can take, you know, you can take a good photo of these with almost any camera. Something that allows you to get close is, is an advantage. Fantastic. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is show you how to put the hive back together and then we're going to wrap that up. We could answer a, another question while we're doing that. Um, we've got some uh, little festooning. Things. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've, we've had it open for a while. The bees are starting to do all sorts of things. They're, they're probably thinking, well, we need to build some new comb between the frames and all sorts of things. <laughs> so what I'm actually going to do is smoke the bees out of the way so that we, as I move the frames together again and put it back together, I'm less likely to squash any bees. They hold hands and feet. Yeah, they hold. They hold their. They hold. They use their feet to hold the knee of the other bee. You can kind of see it's not the bottom. Of, it's not feet to feet. It's feet to like knee. There's like a little. It's bees hook knees. Where they latch on. Yeah. Bees knees. <laughs> the bees knees. Is that your three words? <laughs> the bees knees. 
<laughs> there you go. See, so Kath, um, Kathleen was saying about that chamomile, apparently it helps with their digestive system. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's great. Maybe puts them to sleep um, as well. Just see to the fact that you're about to put that frame back in, um, will you put it back in the same place? And With the flow frames, um, oh, it's always good to put it back in the same place if you can. Uh, you can get into a situation where one of these centre frames is bulged out a lot and you put it close to the window and it actually touches the window. Uh, so putting it back is a good idea, but it's not necessarily um, as important with the flow frames as the brood nest. If you've got wonky frames in your brood nest, though, you need to be very careful the way you put them back to, you know, and often it's best just to put them back in the same order. So I've added some smoke here and it's cleared a lot of bees away between the frames, so now I can start moving the frame over. We've still got a lot of bees around this area. So you're going to be moving the frame sideways, but also trying not to squash bees between them here as well. So, look. I just put my hand on a bee. Anyone want to see a stinger up close? Okay. <laughs> There's a stinger sitting on my... Sitting on the finger there. Finger there you go. Thanks, bro. So, look at that. Bee stinger. They've got little barbs, which means they stick in you and yeah. often rip out of the bee. You can actually the, see a bit of it stuck in my hand still. The queen doesn't have any barbs, so she can sting without, uh, get, without dying, basically. Bee? Okay. That's my fault. So. Ah. I was picking up this frame and I accidentally put my hand on a bee and so she stung me. It wasn't that the bees were being like aggressive, it was just that it was my, my mistake. I think I usually get stung because I, I'm doing something wrong <laughs> with the bees. Yeah. Rather than them being particularly here. Do you want me to smoke while you... I just wanted to show you what's happened here. There was a lot of bees festooning in this gap and now there's almost none. So the smoke is a good friend when you go to manipulating frames around and now I can now I can honey? I'll lift up <laughs> and go sideways and what you want to get is a nice flat window here where when you put your frames back in there's no gaps for bees to get out I'm going to do the same thing with this one I'm going to come up and across I'm going to actually lift it up and then place it down again waiting uh, making sure there's no bees there and making sure it's, it's pushed across forming a nice flat window and also pushed forwards. If you haven't done the little adjustment screw in the back you'll also need to nudge the frame forward in this direction so they're all sitting nice and even. Now the last frame can be the trickiest one to get in and sometimes they get kind of locked on each other so let me show you a little bit of a tip there as you put the last frame in. So I'm picking it up here and I find it easiest to put this end in like so first. So you've got, there we go, mirrors catching hive beetles. So you've got this end here in first and then rolling the frame around like this. And that way it seems to stay more in line. And then you're trying to keep it forward so it it doesn't jump back on the other one as you slide it down into position. So if you're having trouble, try that. And then... It helps to have a, a smoker assistant. <laughs> pu push this frame at the back to just drop it into position. And what you now have is a nice flat face here. No gaps for any bees to get out. And that makes for nice viewing. When you've got bees all escaping at the viewing spot, it's just not as nice to be checking the frames and so on. Thank you very much for tuning in with us today. We're going to be putting the inner cover back on. And yeah, we've got a bit of burr comb to clean up. First. A bit of burr comb on there. We could, we could clean that up or I could just leave that for the bees. If you want to clean it up, I'll show you how to do that. And if you're trying to get bees off something, then you need to use a, an abrupt movement. Most things in beekeeping are nice gentle movements, but when you're trying to get bees off, you just need to give it a good knock and uh, 
Yeah, you know, that didn't work, did it? <laughs> <laughs> and um, there you go. Most of those bees will then be off. A couple usually left hanging on, and then you can go ahead and clean the comb off. Now that comb is going to have a little bit of honey in it still, so we want to make sure we take that away. We don't want to leave honey exposed in the apiary or it'll promote robbing. And look, there's a bee kind of stuck in some wax here. So we might free that little bee. And just by taking some uh, wax away there, allowing her to, to escape. There we go. You can go back in your hive. Somehow they cling on, don't they? <laughs> okay, now you've, you're ready to go. There's no bees on it anymore. And it's a case of just scraping with your hive tool. <laughs> There's two ways, usually, on a hive tool. Some uh, have the bevel on both sides. This one's got the bevel on one side. So bevel faces in, and then when you scrape, it's less likely to dig into the wood. And then it's a case of just running down and scraping And that just cleans that up. You can go and keep that and make a candle. And look at that. Beautiful. And enjoy the spoils yeah, of tasting a bit of honey. It's really <laughs> now, if you could pass me that smoker there. It's also nice to add a little bit of smoke around the top of your hive as you put your inner cover back on. And that way you get some bees running off that area it's, and then you just need to seize the moment when there's the least bees possible and sometimes you can do a bit of a slide where you start on a little angle and slide into position to move some of the bees out of the way and that little plug came out we're going to put that on you might decide to use that to collect some comb in the roof if you want to or you can use that area for a feeder and thank you. We've got the roof going on top there. And then we have the key access, don't forget that. Oh, also the door. <laughs> so the key access goes right in here, like that. And you can partially close that to hold that in place. And don't forget to brush any bees out of the way because we have been inspecting. There might be bees in this area. You can close your hive up. Beautiful. Yeah. Opportunistic bee up here. Yes. Bit of honey on that hive tool. Thank you very much for tuning in. We best not forget the observation window as well. You don't want to leave that uh, window off or sunshine might come in and heat up your hive too much. Thanks again and let us know what you'd like us to cover. If you've got ideas of what you'd like to see or questions you'd like answered then let us know and hopefully next week same time we can help answer your questions and it, it's also great that so many people are tuning in on the thread and helping answer all the questions that are there. And, uh, helping each other in this amazing pursuit of beekeeping. If you do want a bit more of a handhold and do an online bee course, we have the beekeeper.org, also a fundraiser for habitat regeneration and protection. Amazing content from experts from all around the world on there. Check it out and that's a great thing to do as well. Thank you.